Welcome back to a new episode of Let's Talk Golf. I'm your host, PGA professional Mark Guttenberg, and have I got a show for you. You know, Let's Talk Golf is a podcast about all things related to golf, and this week we have Mr. Leonard Shapiro, who covered professional football for the Washington Post for 40 years as an award-winning columnist, reporter, and editor. He was the beat reporter for the Post and assigned to the Redskins back in the 70s and continued writing about the team and the NFL for the next 30 years. He's been a sports editor of the Post. He, he returned to writing full-time in 1991, not only as a national NFL reporter, but he started covering golf. He's the author of seven books, including Athletes for Sale, a book about Sam Huff, an autobiography, uh, another biography of John Thompson, who was the coach for the Georgetown uh, basketball team. But his freelance work has appeared in many publications, including Golf Magazine, Golf Digest, Lynx, Golf for Women, The Virginia Golfer. He's been uh, writing about golf and sports for over 40 years. And what makes this show so special is uh, we have Len with us, who was inducted into the writer's wing of the NFL Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2002. He was also a member of the Hall's Selection Committee for 30 years, and he served on the Hall's Senior Selection Committee for 10 years. Len has been uh, president of the Golf Writers Association of America from 2003 and 2004, and has covered over 100 major championships of golf including each of Tiger Woods' 14 majors. He's also served as a longtime selector for the World Golf Hall of Fame. He's been a regular on network and cable television shows, as well as national radio talk shows. He's a highly regarded speaker on a variety of topics, and we are lucky enough to have him talk to us today. Another special note is in 1998, Len was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize by the paper for his obituary of the legendary Washington Post sports columnist Shirley Povich. He's won numerous local and national writing awards, and we, again, can't wait to start talking to Lynn about the game of golf. So tune in. This is going to be an exciting show. There is so much information. I've had to make this a two-part show, and this is part one. We hope you will tune in to both shows. So let's get started. Well, folks, as you heard in the show's intro, we are here today with sports writing royalty, my friend, Mr. Lynn Shapiro, who I first met back in 1983 when I was playing in the Kemper Open. Lynn, welcome to Let's Talk Golf. Thanks, Mark. Great to be here. We're we're so happy to have you. we got a lot to talk about. I think my listeners are going to love what you have to say. So, Lynn, take us back to your first experiences with this great game that we both love so much. Well, my first experiences uh, were growing up on Long Island, uh, a town called Syosset, about 30 miles uh, from New York City. And uh, I was 13 years old, and a friend, my next-door neighbor, was a caddy at a local country club. And he said, well, you want to come out? You know, we can get five, $5 a bag. Uh, if you carry 36 holes and go double, you can make 20 bucks for the day. Now, in 19, whatever, in the in the uh, 1960, that was pretty good money. That was great uh, money. Anyway, uh, I started caddying. Uh, never did double the first couple of months because I never, I, I knew nothing about golf. <laughs> I mean, the first time I caddied the guy, I, I picked up a quarter uh, on the green. I said, anybody lose a quarter? And the guy said, uh, son, that's where you mark your ball. Uh, oh, that okay. Too. But the guy was great. He, tur- he taught me how to do everything. and. Awesome. And I went off from there and, and, and caddied literally through my high school days and through college and helped pay my way through college. So you, did you play at all? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, once I started caddying, of course, uh-huh. uh, the good news was they had uh, caddy day on Monday. So you could go out on Monday at this club and uh, you could go from dawn, you know, from, from dusk to dawn and uh, you could play 36, however much you wanted to play. And I played and I loved it. And uh, I think I had a pair of, a set of Patty Berg clubs, believe it or not. Oh, Wilson, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. And then uh, eventually got some Tommy Armors and then climbed up the ladder and uh, I'm still playing badly, but that's another story. <laughs> still going at it with the Wednesday Whackers. I go out with know. the Wednesday Whackers, but I, I love the game, always love the game. Uh, it was a great place for me to get away from everything. Uh, played in college, uh, played just with my friends, you know, never, never got really good. I had the greatest summer job you could ever have between my for two years in college. I was a caddy master and a starter up in a little uh, golf resort up in the Catskill Mountains, uh, where where I could also learn how to play speed golf. You know, I had to finish shining the shoes and fixing the clubs 
at six o'clock, but I could probably get in 27 holes in about two and a half hours before it got dark, you know, playing by candlelight at the end. But so I love the game and, and, uh, the pros at this club uh, taught me a little bit of golf and taught me, you know, gave me some lessons. It, it was great experience. And I made a lot of money. Yeah. It sounds like the making to the movie Caddyshack. Oh my you know? gosh, That's the yeah. same background there. Well, you know, when you were a kid, did you dream of becoming a sports writer as a kid, or did you want to play sports professionally? Well, you know, I was very lucky. I was one of the few uh, people uh, who knew what they wanted to do when they were about 16 years old. I had a wonderful e- English teacher. Uh, I played soccer, and I played baseball, and I was a, the manager for the basketball team. But in the wintertime, uh, this teacher, teacher says, why don't you come out for the school paper? I said, well, okay, I'll come out for the school paper, and I wrote a couple of stories, and... and uh, did that, and then he sent me to a journalism institute at Northwestern University between my junior and senior year of high school, in which uh, I spent six weeks in Chicago, and maybe with kids from all around the country, and uh, I knew I, I was hooked from that point on. So I, I became a sports editor of my college paper at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, I wound up getting a master's degree at the University of Missouri, and my semester at uh, my last semester at Missouri was uh, they had a program where you came to Washington and you worked as a uh, Washington correspondent for a bunch of little papers around the country who couldn't afford to send their own person to D.C., but we were their little Washington bureau. And while I was doing that, it's the fall of 1969, uh, I had heard that the Washington Post uh, was hiring college students with sports backgrounds for the sports department to take college uh, high school and, and high school scores over the telephone on Friday nights and Saturday nights. And that's how I started at the Post. Uh, you would come in, uh, you would write one paragraph, two paragraph little stories based on a call from the football's team manager, you know, and uh, it learned, you learned how to write on deadline and, uh, again, right place at the right time. As soon as I got my master's degree, uh, and I thought I, <clears throat> thought I wanted to be a political writer, but uh, I had this sports background and... Uh, the Post hired me as a as a sports writer as a uh, as a co- to cover high school sports in 1969. Uh, I did that for a couple of years. Wound up covering uh, uh, some college football in 1973. I was assigned at the ripe old age of 25 uh, to cover the Washington Redskins for the Washington wow. Post, which was a big deal. Yeah. But, and and, and uh, made me very nervous. Uh, did it for the next seven years, and uh, the rest I, I hate to say it is sort of history. That's awesome. Well, yeah. this is great because I've got a question for you a little later in the show that you're going to you're gonna be the perfect source to give me an answer to. But, you know, in the bio we mentioned this, that you've covered over 100 major golf championships. Yes, yes. Can you tell us about your first major, and, and is there one that sticks out more than the rest? Well, my first major was a British Open uh, at uh, Royal Birkdale, and it was won by Ian Baker Finch. Uh, the dark shark, they call him, he was his... Mm. Australian, and he had dark hair, and he wasn't the shark, you know, yeah. like, like Norman. Uh, and uh, he was great, wonderful guy. You know, you hear him now on uh, doing doing the golf commentary on uh, ESPN and ABC. Fabulous, and, and excuse me, for CBS. And uh, won the tournament, and it was the first time I got caught in that traffic jam at the 18th, at the 72nd hole, you know, where the the British Open crowd, you've seen the, the pictures oh, where, yeah. the, where they put the barriers down, and the, the player crazy. gets mobbed, uh-huh. you know, and you got to walk through a sea of people, and, you know, you're getting bounced, and it was my first experience with that, uh, and uh, he was a delightful guy, uh, so that was that was my first major, a British Open, uh, which is a heck of a way to get started, by the That's way. That's an awesome way to get started. Yeah. Was there one major in those hundred that you remember? Oh, yeah, well, the, the, oh, there's no question. The, the, the Tiger Woods wins the Masters 1997. Oh, yeah. Uh, I had covered Tiger as a junior a little bit, not much, uh, you know, when he won the uh, uh, U.S. Amateur, uh, but didn't, no, didn't cover him very much. I did, however, the year before, in 1996, uh, for some reason, the Post sent me out to Las Vegas to do a feature on this young up-and-coming player. Now, everybody knew who Tiger was. Sure. You know, he was on the tour, and he was on a, you know, he was on a limited, uh, whatever, whatever exemption it was. I think he could play seven events, and if he yeah, made enough money, he could play the next mm-hmm. year. Uh, anyway, so they sent me to Vegas, and of course, Tiger wins the tournament. Uh, and I was about the only national guy there. 
So I wrote the mm. column, uh, wrote the stories about Tiger that weekend, and uh, including getting the check from four Las Vegas showgirls. Uh, God only knows what <laughs> oh, happened that geez. night, but you know we're, we're not was, going. Well, how old was he at that point? He was twenty one. Twenty one. Yeah, let's okay. not. All go right. There. So that's my background. Ninety six. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now ninety seven. Masters, first Masters of the year, uh, first major of the year at the Masters. Uh, and here comes Tiger, and he shoots uh, 40, 40 on, the front. on the front nine. Eh, okay, let's go find somebody else. And then he comes back and goes <laughs> crazy on the back nine, gets himself back into it. And, of course, then he wins by 12 shots or uh, I think he was 18 over. What was he, 19 over, uh, one by 12, not even close. Yeah. Uh, but I, like I'll, I'll, eight, I'll, seven, the, the story eight. that I will never forget, uh, the scene I'll never forget is uh, Lee Elder it was from Washington, D.C., played right. out of Washington. Uh, and Elder had driven up on that Sunday morning uh, from his place in South Florida, got a speeding ticket along the way, couldn't talk his way out of it with a Georgia cop, of course. This is 1997. Yeah. Uh, and I'm standing on the first tee watching Tiger come to the first tee on Sunday, standing next to Lee Elder, who's a, who I've known pretty well because I've yeah, covered him. Sure. And as Tiger walks through there, th- through a funnel of people from the practice green over to the first tee, I turned around, and up on the second floor of the Augusta National Clubhouse, there's a balcony that goes all around. And all you saw were the uh, the waiters, the busboys, the maids, the, mm. the janitors, You know, most of them uh, African-Americans, uh, and all of them watching the same thing everybody else is watching from the, the, the club. I'll never forget the scene. And then Elder, I look over, and there's Elder, and as Tiger's preparing to tee off, Elder has tears coming out of his eyes. Uh, and, of course, everybody knows Lee was the first African-American to play in the Masters. Yeah. Uh, even though he had, you know, several guys, and Charlie Sifford should have qualified. They right. wouldn't let him in. Right. When Elder made it, they had to let him in uh, in 1974. Uh, he had won a tournament in Pensacola, I think it was. Yeah. And, uh, but just, and, and so that sort of made my story, obviously. That was how I got into the story about Lee Elder. He said something about you know no 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 black man is ever going to have to uh, uh, shuffle and, and and bend and stoop at a place like Augusta National anymore. It was something to that effect. Yeah. Uh, and it was just the most memorable. And then of course you know Tiger wins it and uh, the great scene with his father at the end. Uh, Earl, who was was his, his his teacher and his friend and his mentor and of course his father and more than anything. And uh, so that was a great great experience. Really cool story. Yeah, I mean, the, the history there is amazing. I, I remember my first major, I was 11 years old, was at Congressional. Oh, yeah. And Ken Venturi won. Oh, my sure. My dad took me, and uh, I'll never forget how hot it was that day. 1976. Was, uh, six, was no. 64. I'm sorry, 64. 64 I'm thinking yeah. of 76 yeah. PGA. Yeah, and then, of course, my second most major, which was, I guess, a little before you started covering golf, was Jack Nicklaus. Oh, yeah, at the uh, Masters, at 86. 86. Uh, he was 46, so. yeah. Incredible experience. I also meant to tell you, by the way, my my home course growing up on Long Island was Beth Page. Beth Page. Oh, he played and, Beth Page. Well, well, I, I grew up fifteen minutes from the from the, and I would go there, and you'd get there, and I go with my friends, and and uh, well, there's a three hour wait at the at the at, at the red course. There's a two and a half at the white. There's a three hour wait at the yellow. How about the black? Go to the black. Oh, Twenty minutes. Nobody knew, you know, except you know, there was a sign, you know, only that's, experience. We didn't know. That certainly changed. So we played the black because it was only a 20-minute wait. You remind me of Steve Greiner. We did a, a podcast with him about Wounded Warriors, and he grew up in New York and yeah. caddied at Beth Page yeah. Black all yeah. the time. Yeah. So uh, very, very good. Well, how about the Ryder Cup, the Solheim Cup, and the President Cup events? These events seem to ignite a completely different atmosphere. You know, the war by the shore was super intense, especially when Bernhard Langer missed that putt on 18. Right. And then there was the country club at Brookline when Justin Leonard made that bomb that concluded the miracle comeback. And, and that famous saying by Ben Crenshaw, I believe in fate. That's all I'm going to say. And then yeah. they went. And then there was the, the Solheim Cup when Annika chipped in and had to rechip because she hit out a turn. You know, it's just a different atmosphere. Uh, can you share from an in, insider's view a, a story our viewers might enjoy but not know about? Well, um, well, the Ryder Cup that first, uh, the uh, War by the Shore was my first Ryder Cup, oh, okay. and uh, Kiowa. and that at Keough Island, and I had never seen anything quite like it. I'd never seen anything quite like the Ocean Course, quite frankly. Yeah, that was, that was a stunning it. place. But it, it it was so far over the top, um, you know, because 
you know, the, 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 the players, some of the players, Corey Pavin sort of led the way. He was wearing army fatigues, mm. you know, like, as if it was a war. Like, come on. It's not yeah, a war. It, really. got, it got a little out of hand. The fans got a little out of hand. Uh, the good news is that, uh, you know, it, it turned out to be very compelling. I mean, Mark Halkovecchia blew his match and it was way ahead. And then, the and then he walked out to the beach thinking that he had blown. And, and he actually had a half, if I'm not mistaken. He, he didn't yeah, lose his but match. But he was like four or but five But he was like, yeah, he was, he was way up. Uh, and then they come back and Langer misses the six-foot putt. I mean, there isn't, there's not a player on the face of the earth who could have made that six-foot putt that day, I don't think. Yeah, uh, had a lot of break to yeah, it. And, and not only that, just the pressure. The pressure, the meaning uh, of it. You all. know, Langer, the first German to play on a Ryder Cup team. Uh, it, it was it was quite something. That was my first uh, experience with it. Uh, and and they, some of them sort of all blend together. I mean, there was... Uh, you know, some of the confrontations between Ballesteros and Paul Azinger. Oh right my God! I was walking with Azinger uh, when yeah, when uh, tell us uh, yeah, about it, that. well it was it was uh, Azinger or I'm sorry Azinger was doing television. He was not playing. He, I think he was still at that point recovering from he'd had some cancer in his shoulder. Oh, okay, if That's I'm not a mistaken, story, yeah. and he was still doing TV. And of course, he had been you know on the team the year before, and it was Tom Lehman going up against Seve. And, right, that's uh, it. and I'm, that's I'm, 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 I can re- barely remember what I had for breakfast, Mark. But, but as I recall, <laughs> uh, there was some concern about a, a putt being given, or somebody was away and shouldn't have been away, and uh, there was a little dispute on the green. And Azinger, we literally, there are about five of us walking with Azinger. We literally had to hold him back because he wanted to go out and confront. Because <laughs> he, he always complained about Seve whenever they played. Yeah. Oh God, the guy was always coughing on my backswing or jingling change in his pocket or doing something to drive me crazy. And Azinger wanted to go slug him. Yeah. And as it turned out, as if I'm not mistaken, I think, I think uh, Layman won the match. I think so too. Yeah. I, I, that but part yeah. I don't remember. It's so funny how we yeah, remember more about yeah. I, I also remember the uh, Justin Leonard making that putt. Mm. And uh, you know the the Europeans being very upset because uh, Alatha Ball was still had to putt yeah. and, and could have made his and putt. We stormed the green. And we stormed and, the yeah. green and blah blah blah, which was uh, again. But uh, you know what? That's the emotion of the event. And, yeah, you know, that, I mean that nobody became, did that with any intent to be yeah. disrespectful. Yeah. And the yeah, other yeah. side, would, but who knows? You know, yeah. the President's Cup was was always interesting, only because I got to meet presidents. I mean. Uh, I met Gerald Ford at a President's Cup. I met the old, the older George Bush, uh, George the Elder at a President's Cup. You know because they played it at RTJ, uh-huh. uh, and and that was always fun. And uh, yeah. but I, I that that was not the same. That that was never the same as a Ryder Cup. I only covered a couple of Solheim Cups. Uh, I covered one at uh, at the Greenbrier, mm-hmm. uh, and I couldn't tell you what happened other than it was a great event. I love the yeah. Greenbrier, great golf course, but th- those were different. Yeah, the Ryder Cup really became interesting when they brought all of Europe in. Yes. It used to be yes. just Brit, Just Brits the Brits and, and Ireland. Uh, yeah. And then we started losing, and then it yeah. became interesting. And, and, yeah, I think it did get a little out of hand with the War by the Shore and, and some of those other events. But then it started to take a turn, and people started realizing, hey, you know, this is not what the event is all about. And, yeah. and now it's it's good-hearted jabbing, you know, the match between Rory and Patrick oh, sure, Reed. Sure. But at the end, they hug, they shake hands. There's no bitterness. So, but I'll tell really you, the uh, the one the one in Boston, where you know the famous comeback, uh, that got very ugly. Yeah, uh, and it got ugly because uh, there were too many people who were drinking too much, and there was heckling. Montgomery got yeah. viciously heckled. Uh, at, just as he did a congressional uh, the mm-hmm. year that uh, Ernie Els won the Open won the here. Open, I was there. But uh, yeah, and uh, it, it got so far ahead, and then of course the great comeback, and and uh, the rest is is also history. Yeah. Well, now this next question is kind of selfish question. As as I venture into this new arena as a podcast interviewer, as a sports writer and, and interviewee, or interviewer yourself, do you have a strategy when you approach somebody for an interview? Are there some do's and don'ts that every sports writer knows going into an interview? Well, uh, after a close game, you never want to get too close. You, you want to give them about a 15-minute cooling off period. Okay. But uh, that, that's number one. And number two, if, you, if you're sitting down with somebody for a long, long interview uh, and they're sort of controversial, you, you sort of want to lead into the controversy. You don't want to hit them right off the bat with... So, do you beat your wife? I mean, <laughs> what about the guy who said you beat your wife? Yeah. It'll build up to a little bit. Get, and, and get related to him first. Yeah, yeah, you have to, and yeah. then you have to ask the tough question. And you, the, the most important thing is, though, 
uh, as a journalist, you cannot be afraid to ask a hard question. If you are, you're in the wrong business. You know, yeah. uh, you got to ask the tough question. Now, doing sports, what could be the tough? Well, there are a lot of tough questions. You know, we're, we're finding out uh, away from golf a little bit this this whole anthem thing and Colin Kaepernick. Oh, yeah. Well, this is a very tough story to cover, and and uh, I had to cover a gazillion stories, uh, not like that, but. You're talking about drugs, talking about concussions, talking about injuries, talking about no black, uh, no black uh, coaches in the NFL, no black general managers back in the seventies, eighties, and nineties. Yeah. So you had it, you know, you you got to be you got to be prepared. Yeah, I mean, I, that actually is a perfect lead into my next question because we often hear the same questions after a victory. What does this win mean to you? Yeah. Or, uh, and then we get the same answers too. What I, does it I, feel like? I hate that question. Yeah, me too. Or are the responses? And it's true, but it's 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 a pan to answer. I played one shot at a time, and I stayed in the present. You'll hear that on every tour from every winner. Oh yeah, because these are not trained people to get in front of a mic. They're yeah. athletes that play. But um, who who would you say is like one of the toughest pros you ever had to interview? And and then who are some of your favorite pros that you ever? Okay, had to toughest interview? guy I ever had to interview was was uh, uh, VJ Singh, who was not my favorite. Yeah, uh, who was uh, not very friendly. Not uh, even though he looks like he's a well, maybe he is with his friends. Yeah. He had a great abiding suspicion of the media. Mm-hmm. Part of it having to do with early in his career, he was accused of cheating. Yeah. He was cheating. thrown off the European yeah. tour. Yeah, exactly. He went to Borneo, then became a teaching pro in Borneo, then worked on his game, and then eventually came back. So I think there was a great suspicion there. He he was a very, very tough interview. Uh, Tommy Armour the third of all people, it was a very tough interview. Don't ask me why. Not that anybody needed to talk to him very much. Yeah. Uh, Tiger Woods, uh, in 20 years of covering golf for the Washington Post, I think I might have had, I could count on the number, on my one hand, the number of times I had a one-on-one interview with him. It was always in a press conference situation. He very rarely granted one-on-ones. Mm-hmm. The only time he did it was if he was promoting an event he was he was in. Uh, he promoted his first tournament here. You know the uh, the AT and T the AT and T National. Uh, you know when he when he wanted it when he wanted something he would do it. Sure, uh, sure. But there was always a guy behind you who would say, "Okay, ten minutes next." You know, yeah. so you never really got, you never were re- really able to get into the guy and 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 really press him, and it's never changed. And uh, uh, he's a very he was a very tough interview. And when you got him, he was very personable, very nice. Uh, when he did press, now all of that is not to say he was not accessible in terms of when he went to a tournament. You knew if he was playing. Every Tuesday he would do, every Tuesday he would do an interview, uh, a media session in the media room with you know however many guys were covering and women were covering. Uh, he would stay and answer most of the questions, but then you'd go back and look at your notes or you'd look at the transcript of it, and you would say to yourself, he really didn't say very much there. <laughs> and it was one cliche yeah. after another. He'd say goofy things. Very guarded. Anyway, very very now the best interviews ever. Yeah. Uh, my favorite all time is Jack Nicholas, who would give you the sh- shirt off his back. Great story. Uh, my first U.S. Open was at Balthasarol in the early 90s okay. in New Jersey. And Jack was playing, and he was also doing a commentary for ABC. So, first ring, you, you gotta find, you gotta go find Jack Nicholas when he finish, finishes his round, no matter, no matter what. And so about 10 of us went out to the 18th hole and outside the, where they signed their scorecard. Uh, and uh, we're talking to Jack, and he's going. And he, he was not in contention. He shot seventy once, but it's Jack Nicholas. Now we're standing there, and a guy comes over, and he says, uh, uh, "Mr. Nicholas, they want you up in the tower." This is a kid from ABC, one of their, one of their people. They need you up in the tower. Uh, uh, they need you right away. Okay, I'll be right there. Don't worry about it. Uh, and Jack, being Jack, who loves to talk just kept talking and of course we kept asking questions finally about five minutes later the same poor kid you know who they dispatched to get jack comes over to jack and says mr nicholas they really need you on the tower you know you're on the air in about 30 seconds and he looks at the guy and he says young man let me tell you something some of these writers standing around me have been covering me for 35 40 years i will be there when i've answered every one of their questions and not until i answer their questions and that's when I'll be there, and you can go tell him that. At which point, Jack looked at, at us and said, "Anybody, any guys, any, anybody got any more questions?" And we, no, <laughs> go ahead. 
But that's the kind of guy that's he was. An always awesome did. Story. I've yeah. always loved Jack Nicholson. Yeah, he was great. Nick Price was among my all time favorites. Okay. Arnie, uh, you get the, uh, uh, Arnie was was fabulous. Yes, I, I, I've interviewed Arnie. Uh, uh, Norman was pretty good. Trevino, uh, boy, he's never at a yeah. Loss Trevino, words. though, you know, there was an edge with with Lee. Was there? Uh, there, there was a public Lee when he was on TV, and there was when he was doing commercials. But there was a very different side one on one. Sometimes uh, he was the older he got, the worse it got. Uh, okay, he was okay, but Didn't not know. on my uh, not on my top five. Kind of interesting you say that because I, I mean, in the public eye, he seems like an oh. affable guy. But I've, I've heard some guy locker room stories about him, and uh, yeah. I won't repeat them. But uh, yeah. So how about oh, I this? repeat them? Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> this is your show. Yeah. So do you have a most embarrassing moment you can share with us uh, during your forty plus years of covering sports? Oh boy, uh, gotta be at least one. Well, um, the, well, there, there there have been some some tough moments. Um, uh, I got kicked off, got kicked out of a George Allen Redskins practice uh, once, and told not to come back. At which Why? point I told, uh, I said, "Well, you know, if you you've got a problem with me, here's here's my editor. You know, you ought to call him." And uh, I called the editor, and my editor was a guy named Ben Bradley, who may be the greatest editor in the history of, of, of okay. newspaper. And he's the guy Jason Robards played in All the President's Men, the okay. movie. Okay, yeah, uh, was. Ma- Arguably, the you know he was Woodward and Bernstein's uh, editor in, in Watergate, and Bradley told George Allen, "Listen, uh, it, it's fine. You want to kick our reporter out of practice? Be my guest, but uh, we won't be coming back to cover your practices. The only time we'll write about your team is when you play, uh, and that'll be the end of the coverage." And uh, the next day, I was back in practice. So they just didn't want anybody there. Well, no, no, no. He, I, I had written something that he didn't like, and oh, he wanted so me there to was, out. Gotcha, gotcha. There, there have been. Uh, you caught me off guard there, Mark. I got to think about that. Yeah. But uh, you know, I've I've never no on a golf course. I was always worried about getting in somebody's line or yeah. or moving too soon or you know incurring somebody's wrath. Uh, but I, I I always because I was a caddy, I sort of knew what to do. I knew where yeah. to go. I knew yeah. what to do, and 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 so I stayed out of people's ways. Uh, but no, nothing nothing untoward. Okay. Well, I'm sorry yeah. to put you on the spot there, but you but if know, it comes to me, I'll, 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 I'll I know I've we'll had do another show. Plenty of embarrassing <laughs> moments myself. In fact, this year I went to the PGA uh, Championship at Quail Hollow, yeah. and I was on the 18th hole, and I had and everybody has their cell phones, yeah, there, right? Oh, yeah. So I got mine there, and I'm like right on the right side of the fairway. There's a fairway bunker, and uh, Ian Poulter was in there getting oh, yeah, a yeah, shot. Yeah. I said, "Wow, here's a great shot. I've just put on my little video." They come up to me and say, sorry, sir, there's no videos. Right. So I said, okay. And I kind of put the thing down, and I'm looking around. Everyone's got their video on them but me, and yeah. I snuck it back up. All of a sudden, a lady pulls me aside, takes my ticket, really? puts a W on the back of it. Oh, You've been wow. warned. I said, oh, no, the PGA is going to take away my membership. <laughs> that was embarrassing for me, but I'm sure I've had worse. Well, listen, you know, this show, it's about golf. But it's not every day I get to interview a member of the NFL's Pro Football Hall of Fame for the Writers' Wing, which you achieved yeah. in 2002. Well, how does the one get to be selected, and, and what were you feeling when you gave your acceptance speech? Well, you know, it's, it's, it was a, a, a very interesting process, and I, people, I always tell people, always, oh, you were in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I'm in the Writers' Wing of the Hall of Fame, which is Still a wonderful, wonderful honor. Yeah, uh, it's you get there uh, a vote of your peers which is the best part of it, that, that you, people who, my fellow write, football writers, uh, voted me. In, uh, we, I won something called the uh, Dick McCann Award, which is what gets you into it. Uh, and it's, you know, lifetime service to, to, to sports, to, to covering professional football. Uh, Dick McCann was an old uh, New York Giants press guy, PR guy, and a writer. And anyway, but yeah, it was, it was a, a fun, fun weekend. Now, uh, we don't get to make our speeches... The day the players do. Um, there are uh, Canton, Ohio does a magnificent job. Uh, it's it's a whole whole long weekend, and uh, they have a breakfast, and then they have a luncheon and dinners and blah blah. There's a huge huge breakfast they have in uh, basically a small arena that seats about two thousand people, and, and that's where the uh, the writer is honored, and that's where I gave a little speech and uh, was honored with a guy who also was the uh, won the broadcast award that year, and uh, but we don't we're, we're acknowledged during the main ceremony. They ask you to stand up, and Len Shapiro won the Dick McCann Award. He's, his name will be in the Hall of Fame for in perpetuity. Great, happy to be there, and uh, a great thrill, and and and, and honored to, to have it. 
uh, and and I used to cover those things, and and uh, always very emotional days for people, particularly. Uh, I also voted uh, for thirty years as a voter on the Pro Football Hall of Fame selection committee, uh, which I which I am no longer on since I retired from the post about five years ago. But uh, I was involved. So anytime a, 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 one of the Redskins uh, came up. Uh, and made the final 15, I was the one who had to present it to my fellow writers. Because oh, cool. we're, the, we're the ones who decide. The writers decide. Yeah. It's a Sunday. It's a, it's the sat- the meeting is held the Saturday morning before the Super Bowl, uh, two, a day and a half before the Super Bowl. Uh, we gather, you know, 45 writers and broadcasters, and we do these presentations. So that's that was, that was a, a, a big treat. I mean, uh, people, you know, John Riggins, uh, Art Monk, uh, George Allen, who I felt really good about getting into the Hall of Fame because mm-hmm. he and I had a hate-hate relationship. Did you? Uh, love hate, hate. Was hate. he the coach when you got kicked off the field? Uh, he, he, well, yeah, he, he was he a great, was, he was a great coach, good. but he was. Uh, he, we used to call him Nixon with a whistle. Uh, he was <laughs> paranoid <laughs> about the media. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Gave us a hard time. Never announced anything. Never told us he was making a trade or somebody mm-hmm. had been cut or somebody was injured. He made me a much better reporter because I had to go work and find out all these things myself. Uh, without somebody announcing it, uh, and we we had our moments, but but there was no question in my mind he was a great football coach. He had been shunned for many many years by the Hall of Fame because of the way he was, because he was Nixon with a whistle, and a lot of the writers didn't like him, didn't get along with him. Uh, but I felt it was my duty basically to say, hey, you know, let's put all that aside. This is look at his record, look what he's done, look how he changed the, the face of several franchises. Uh, won a, an NFL title as a defensive coordinator with the Chicago Bears. Uh, and this guy needs to be in the Hall of Fame. He was a great innovator. And uh, finally convinced them when George was a senior candidate and finally got him in. So I felt very good about that and felt very good about Art Monk, who took a while to get in. And if I was still writing and on that committee, I would be pushing very hard for Joe, Joe Jacoby. Amazing. Amazing yeah. career, Len. That's really good stuff. What an incredible background we've gotten today from Len Shapiro. I hate to end the show at this moment, but guess what? There's more. If you tune in in two weeks, we're going to hear part two of this interview, and Len is going to share with us some of his thoughts about uh, many different ideas. We're going to hear about the Pulitzer Prize. We're going, to, we're going to get some of his insights on who he thought was the greatest golfer of all time and why, so... Don't forget to tune in next week to, or two weeks, to our next episode of Let's Talk Golf. I'm your host, PGA professional, Mark Guttenberg. Once again, you can find us on YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, LinkedIn, Facebook. We're everywhere. If you got anything to say, please contact me on my website at guttenbergsgolf.com. And we will look forward to you tuning in in two weeks for part two of this interview with Hall of Fame sports writer, Len Shapiro. (laughs) 